for the invitation. It's a pity that I'm not uh, um, in KITP in person, and it, it seemed that uh, I took the right decision not to come since I got uh, positive like four days ago. I had mild symptoms. So, uh, and then, I mean, hope, I mean, uh, it's great that I, I am at least able to give this talk. So, um, uh, I'll be talking about the flash tube spectrum and the worksheet axion. And this is work that has been done in collaboration with Mike Fletcher, and it's based on, um, on these uh, proceedings. Uh, and there will be a, a, a new, uh, I mean, a longer write up coming in the next uh, couple of weeks. So, let me um, let me start um, with some uh, generalities. So now, now we know that in QCD quarks are confined in bound states by forming flux tubes of chromomagnetic and chromoelectric flux. Now these long flux tubes behave pretty much like strings in the sense that we put the quarks um, apart. The potential of the of the flux tube increases linearly with um, with uh, the separation with the weight given by by the string tension, and at some point, if we keep pulling, I mean, this string breaks, and we have the so-called string breaking effect. Now, of course, in order to have string breaking and being able to observe this in a lattice calculation, we need dynamical fermions. However, in my work, um, I'll be working in pure gauge theory, and such, an, a, such a, a phenomenon uh, won't be there, so we don't expect the string breaking to happen. Now, imagine that we take the flux tube and we place it at a particular um, position in space. Uh, that means that we spontaneously break the translation invariance in the D minus two directions transverse to the flux tube, and therefore we'll be having D minus two of these matrix also nodes arising from this uh, broken symmetry. And therefore, we would expect to have a low energy effective string theory model describing the energy spectrum of the flux tube. Now, a flux tube is an object that lives in SU3 and it has an intrinsic weight. And therefore, um, one could also expect to have, uh, in addition to string modes, and other kind of massive excitations, um, which should be of the order of the mass gap of the theory. Now, how can we observe such um, excitations, resonances, for instance? Well, the idea is simple. Um, what we do, we, is that we extract using lattice techniques the excitation spectrum of the flux tube, and we compare it to a theoretical description for this, uh, um, which we know that it works well. And then we check whether there is a small set of lattice data which is in a striking disagreement with the theoretical description. And you will realize what I'm talking about in the next slides. So uh, we can have open flux tubes and closed flux tubes. We prefer to work with closed flux tubes because we don't deal with. Uh, with, with quarks, I mean, closed flux tube or tunnelon is just a winding, is, is a flux tube that winds around, um, around the, the torus, the spatial torus, and we don't deal with any, any I mean, with, uh, with the sources. Now, um, of course, the spectrum of the flux tube can also capture other pure gauge phenomena, such as global flux tube mixing and flux tube anti flux tube mixing. Of course, this kind of phenomena cannot be captured by an effective string theory model. And therefore, we want to get rid of them. And the way to do is, to do that is to uh, suppress this kind of phenomena uh, by moving to the larger limit. So, in the larger limit, you don't expect such mixing to to, to interfere, let's say, with the with the energy spectrum of the flux tube. So, what we do is that we investigate the spectrum of closed flux tubes in the larger limit. And so far, I mean, we have published these three uh, papers here in three platform dimensions. Let me see now that what are the theoretical expectations that one would expect uh, to provide a good um, description for the confining flux tube. So uh, the first one is the um, Gordon Boltzmann and Boreba in point three, or, or I would be simply uh, referring to it as um, the number of string. So if we quantize number of we'll get this, uh, this uh, spectrum, which is described by the string tension, the, um, the length of the flux tube, the winding number in so uh, a flux tube that um, in, in fundamental representation will have winding number of one. Um, and that's what we, and also a, a, a flux tube in, in, uh, with, uh, in representation with K equals two will have winding number of two, for instance. And that's what we are interested in, mostly on fundamental and also K equals two. We also, um, and this is also described by the winding momentum in units of two pi through the row. 
the transverse momentum, which is taken to be equal to zero because uh, it doesn't provide any useful info physical information, and the total contribution of left and right moving phonons, which are connected to each other by level, the level matching constraint. Now, Nabucco is a Lorentz invariant in um, 26 dimensions. However, we want to build, uh, we can build effective string theory models uh, which are which are Lorentz, Lorentz invariant. We know how to do that. I mean, this has been shown by Luther and Kochinski and Strominger using the two dif different approaches by using two different gauges um, in static gauge, Luther and Kochinski and Strominger in the con uh, in the in, in the conformal gauge. However, I'm pretty sure that uh, there will be talks about these uh, approaches. Um, so both approaches basically lead to the same uh, excitation spectrum of the flux tube, in, uh, which is given as an expansion in one over m. <laughs> so, and the, actually, the relation to Nambucodo of this uh, exp ex expansion is nothing else but uh, the fact that Nambucodo, if one expands Nambucodo, uh, the square root of Nambucodo, one gets exactly this expansion here. Okay. So we actually we expect that it is, uh, the energy will be Nambucodo plus one over L to the power of seven corrections. Now, um, in 2013, Sergei Dubovsky, Rafael Flager, and Victor Korpenko actually showed that we could also provide um, um, predictions for, short, for the energy spectrum for short flux. I mean, this expression here, I mean, works for long flux because it is an, an, an expansion in one over L. And actually, there is uh, a radius of convergence. However, using the um, the, 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 predict, the prediction by the approach by Dubovsky et al., we can extract also the spectrum for short flux. Basically, uh, by using um, the, the, the uniform collisions and appropriate integrability and the thermodynamic that they have. And in addition, we showed that um, the zero minus minus ground state that I will show you, I mean, in the next uh, few slides. Um, can be well uh, interpreted as uh, a worksheet axiom. Actually, this is the anomaly state that we observed on, in our very first cal calculation in 2011, and it, one can provide a good description of this energy state by introducing a worksheet axiom. Now, what do we do on the lattice? On the lattice, first of all, we define the gauge theory in, on a four-dimensional discretized periodic Euclidean space-time lattice. With uh, L parallel, which is the lattice extent, which is equal to the size of the flux tube. And we have two transverse sizes, which are taken to be equal in order to have good rotational properties around the principal axis of the flux tube. And we also have the um, time um, extent. And on the lattice, we calculate uh, quantities by forming, um, by calculating the expectation values of color singlet objects, with which uh, the operators of which are given by uh, the path of the product of closed uh, Wilson loops. This is an example, for instance. And we use the standard Wilson Act in our calculations, where the basic degree of freedom is just a simple packet one can build on the lattice, beta is the inverse coupling, and energies can be calculated using the correlation functions of specific operators. So if, if this, I mean, correlation function can lead us to the energy uh, of the flat tube. This is a pictorialization of this, of this um, correlation function. So we have an operator that projects onto the flux tube, and, uh, and the operator that projects onto the flux tube, uh, I mean, and we change the time separation between these two operators, and we extract the decay, actually, of the correlator as a function of t. So this is the correlator here. We can introduce two complete sets of states here, I mean, between the, the operators and the transverse matrix, and we can show that as t goes to infinity, I mean, this one that uh, we get here, I mean, uh, is dominated by the exponential with the lowest energy, which is just the ground state. Now, if we want to extract the excitation spectrum, we need to use something more sophisticated, which is called the, um, the generalized eigenvalue problem, according to which we build a large basis of operators. Uh, in total, we build 1,200 operators. We calculate the correlation matrix, which is this guy here. That's how it looks like. I mean, this block diagonal. I mean, the diagonal of different irreducible representations. We diagonalize this matrix. We extract the eigenvectors, extract the correlator for each state, and by fitting the results, we extract the mass energy for each state. 
important thing here is to uh, encode the right funding numbers in our operators. So, and how can we build operators that can project onto the um, onto the flux tubes? I mean, we can build them by simply building uh, a polyagog, a spatial polyagog loop, which is the part of the product of these links here. I mean, this. I mean, since we have periodic boundary condition, this guy here closes to this guy, so this basically wins around the spatial force. And he also sum over all polyagog loops along its different uh, type lines in order to have translational invariance. So, having seen how we construct our operators, let's see how we, we encode the right quantum numbers. So, the quantum numbers that uh, describe our states is the spin and parity. Now, in order to give a particular value of spin in our operator, we take the operator, we cut it, and we introduce a transverse deformation, something like this here. Okay, and then we rotate it by uh, over around the principal axis with a factor, a weight given by this expression here. And in addition, we also have parity. We have the transverse parity and the R parity. The transverse parity is the, uh, the R parity is the longitudinal parity. And this is an example of how these two different parity planes transform, I mean, transverse deformations. So in total, I mean, spin, uh, spin and parity, giving total five irreducible representations, which are doubled because of our parity. And in total, we get any irreducible representations for zero longitudinal momentum. If our flux tube has longitudinal momentum, then PR, the longitudinal parity, stops being a good fun number anymore. So we just have five irreducible representations. So important thing is that all the spins are um, so the spin j equals zero and j the spin j equals zero is actually um, modulo four. The spin j equals one is modulo two, and the spin the spin j equals two is modulo four again. And this is an example of two operators projecting on to on to j equals zero plus plus and j equals zero minus minus. Now these are all the lattice operators we use to build our. Um, um, well, these are all the transverse deformations we used to build our operators. And let me just comment a bit about the strategy we followed in three plus one dimensions before I go and show you results. So, so we have the simulations. So first of all, we keep the lattice spacing fixed and we move from SU3 to SU5 and SU6 in order to see whether we have important large and um, effects. And then we move to uh, thirds of this lattice spacing to SU3 and SU5. And for this value of SU5 and beta of 18.375, we also extract a K code 2 flux. Now, we do have some uh, constraints, um, such as the fact that as we move for, uh, in, in larger values of N, the time increases. So, to move uh, cubically, so to move from N equals 3 to N equals 6, it be, I mean, the calculation becomes eight times slower. And in order to move closer to the continuum limit, we need fix all the lattice extents so that the flux to length uh, is fixed in physical units. So it means that to move from a lattice spacing to half the lattice spacing, the calculation becomes 16 times slower. And in addition, we have the, um, uh, the critical slowing down with some uh, property of all, I mean, Monte Carlo simulations that uh, depend on local updates. Uh, so for instance, the topological charge basically um, freezes. As we move closer to the continuum, I mean, the, the, the correlation length of the topological charge increases by a factor of, uh, with, a, with a power of six. And as you move to the larger limit, I mean, the, the correlation length increases exponentially. So I think it's time to go to some results. Let me start with two plus one dimensions. And I will show you the case of, um, uh, of, uh, of zero longitudinal momentum. Um, so this is a much simpler uh, system because we don't have, I mean, uh, spin in two plus one dimensions. We just have parity, I mean, as a quantum number. So we focus on uh, positive parity. So what do we do? We actually extract ground state, the first excited state, second, third, and fourth excited state with positive parity and zero longitudinal momentum. Now, the absolute ground state um, is we feed it with the Nabucodo and we extract, we extract the string tension. And once 
once you extract the string condition, then Nabugoro becomes a parameter free predictions for other higher criteria. So if we see here, I mean, uh, the Nabugoro states, I mean, the first excitation of number is expected to, be, uh, to happen left equals and right equals one and to be one fold to generate. So you can see that the first excitation level of flux two becomes fully consistent with Nambugoro at L2 sigma of around 3.5, and it has right generacy. Now, if we go to one step further up and left equals and right equals two Nambugoro, this is expected to be four fold to generate with two positive parity state. Okay, and you, actually, you can actually see these two positive party states which are generate and they become consistent with Nambugoro. Now you can see that negative parity states with zero longitudinal moment appear only for n left equals and right equals two. So if I go to negative parity, negative parity sector, I actually uh, observe that the ground state and the first excited state of flux to with negative parity are actually in accordance with Nambugoro with n left equals and right equals two. Now, if I go to one step further up, n left equals three and, and right equals three, I see that uh, the third excitation is actually consistent with Nambugoto and it has the right energy gap, which tells me that uh, it is uh, a string-like state. Similarly, we observe, um, I mean, similar results for, for, um, uh, for a flux tube with uh, with longitudinal momentum of uh, two equals one, and also with for a long, for, a, for a, um, um, a flux tube with longitudinal momentum two equals two. So what that tells us is that the spectrum of uh, of, of the flux tube in two plus one dimensions is is completely string-like, and there are no other kind of uh, of states appearing in the spectrum. I mean. Of course, one has to keep in mind that uh, uh, by, I mean, this is a lattice calculation. Maybe there is some uh, some uh, kind of operators that we didn't use uh, that could um, that could give rise to such uh, such states. But I, I don't think this is the case. I mean, our basis of operators is quite complete. Uh, the Hilbert space is also quite complete. I would say that it is more likely that the D equals two plus one case does not include any kind of massive excitations. So having seen what happens in two plus one uh, case, let's go and see the three plus one case. Uh, three plus one case, as I explained to you, is more, is more um, complicated because in addition to the parity, we also have the um, spin. Um, now, uh, what I show you here is the ground state, absolute ground state of zero plus plus. Okay. So zero, P parity plus, R parity plus, the five different uh, gauge groups that we use in this, uh, in this calculation. Now, uh, what I show here is the leading order, the next to leading order, and the next to next to leading order in one over L expansion in energy. And you can see that none of these, I mean, uh, I mean, none of these uh, expansions work as, as Nambugoro, which is the, the, the last line you see here, the, the bottom line. Of course, I'm pretty sure that one might ask, um, would, would ask uh, whether I have uh, extracted leading correction in Nambugoro. I'll say here that this is impossible with this kind of data because at that root sigma of 2.5, our data become consistent, completely consistent with Nambugoro. So with just one point below this, uh, this nice agreement, it's really difficult to extract leading or the correction. Of course, the point of this work was not to extract leading correction, but would rather is rather focusing on the excitation spectrum. Now let's go to one uh, again. I, what I didn't say is that we fit this. This data with Nambugoro, we extract the string tension, and once the string tension is known, we, we can use this expression, Nambugoro expression as a parameter free prediction for higher excitation. And these are the lines you see here. Now let's go to the first uh, excitation of Nambugoro, friend left equals and right equals one. This is fourfold to generate with these quantum numbers. These three uh, flux tube states with these quantum numbers I present here. You can see that they are consistent with Nambugoro. Um, they are uh, generate and they become fully consistent. Uh, what is really interesting here is to see how the zero minus minus behaves. 
So if I plot zero minus one ground state, that's actually what I get here. Okay. Yes, there is a state which appears to be the ground state plus a constant term. It looked like a resonance. And this was the first, the first signal of a massive excitation that we could see on, uh, on our uh, latest investigation. So actually, um, also be nice to see whether this result changes if not in, in uh, because what I show you here is uh, actually SU3. So and here you, I show you SU3, SU5, and SU6. You can see that nothing changes, I mean, drastically as we move to the larger limits. And also uh, one could say, okay, I mean, this ground state of zero minus minus, a string-like sta string -like state which approaches slowly then left equals and right equals one, according to Nabucodo. Well, I would answer this by uh, probing, by extracting, extracting the first excitation level of zero minus minus flux and see whether this one approaches then left equals and right equals two, I mean, according to Nambugoro, and instead it appears that it slowly approaches this line here, then left equals and right equals two, equals one. So it, it is more likely that this is the, the stringy like state of uh, that equals two and left equals and right equals one. And this state here is the massive excitation. Now, this is the Dubosky et al. prediction, uh, which uh, you can see that it has a nice agreement with our data. And now, if I extract the absolute ground state from this excitation of the zero minus minus excitation, I get this nice plateau that is in agreement with the with the mass of the axion extracted by by Dubovsky uh, et al. And this is the first excitation that approaches slowly then um, left equals to right equals one. So uh, just to say here that um, what I show here, I mean in blue. This is the first excited the ground state of zero plus plus, and this blue state is the first excited state of zero plus plus. Okay. Now what I'm going to show you is the second excited state of zero plus plus uh, flux loop. And this is what I get, which actually looks like it's very similar to the case of zero minus minus. It's the ground state plus a constant term. So and if I if I subtract the absolute uh, ground state, and I compare it with global mass, actually we see that there is no agreement with global mass, but if I plot why is the axion mass um, that um, uh, Dubovsky et al. extracted, you can see that this actually agrees uh, completely with this, with the interpretation of having a state with twice the axion mass. So it looks like our spectrum also includes a bound state with a very uh, low binding energy of two axioms. So uh, just to take an idea, I mean, we also extract the energy spectrum of other irreducible representations which are more massive. This is the zero minus plus, which is in agreement with Nambugodo. This is the zero plus minus, which also is in agreement with Nambugodo, with then left equal and right equal four. This is the two plus minus, which is in agreement with Nabugoda. You can see that this ground state, I mean, uh, there is one ground state with two plus minus um, in Nabugoda with n left equal to two and right equal to two. And that's what we get. And the next excitation level of the flux flagstop with uh, quantum number two plus minus is uh, on the next excitation level. What is really interesting now is to go and see what happens with J called one. Equals one, we observe that um, the ground state and the first excited state are, are um, generate, which is in agreement with uh, Nambucoto. And in addition, we've extract the second excited state. It looks like uh, it approaches Nambucoto very slowly. There is this nice agreement. And uh, just mind that equals one is actually modulo, modulo two. So it could be it could be this state here with equals three. Okay. Now, if I go to J equals one minus, we get again uh, this uh, generosity, okay? And uh, this is the first excited state, which, I mean, it could be also this state, but the important thing here is that two states here look like the ground state plus a constant term. So, I mean, uh, which is between the global mass and twice the mass. So there is this question whether we also observe 
uh, kind, some kind of massive hidden within these quantum numbers. Now, close, I want to close uh, the presentation by moving to the Q equals one sector. Now, in Q equals one sector, according to Nabucco, the ground state one can build with n left equals one and right equals zero, which have Q equals one. So if I, if I extract the ground state of Q equals one, I get this. I mean, state here, which is in agreement with Nambugoro, and left equals one and right equals zero. And if I go to the next excitation level of Nambugoro, this should be seven fold to generate. I mean, I provide here five states, okay, which are, uh, appear to cluster around Nambugoro. But what is really striking here and nice to see is what happens with J equals zero and P minus, which uh, include, uh, I mean, uh, has the, the same quantum numbers as the axion. And if I plot this, I mean, the ground state with J equals zero, I know here, which has um, really um, deviates a lot from the number body prediction. And actually, if I compare this, okay, that I, I expect, I suspect it is the axion with a naive comparison where I take the ground, absolute ground state plus the mass of the axion uh, plus uh, the um, momentum in a, in, a, in a relativistic way, I mean, I get this, uh, this, uh, this nice approximate agreement, I would say. So it is likely that the state that you, you observe, it is, uh, the, um, it is the, um, the axion plus some momentum on it. Now, so finally, for the Q equals two sector, I mean, the absolute ground state is four for the generate. These are the four states that you see here with J equals zero plus, J equals one, J equals two plus, and two minus. Now, if I plot the zero minus, just to see what happens here, the ground state of zero minus, it appears to have large deviations from number of expectation, which is n left equals three and right equals one, which looks like this in action. I mean, if I, and if I compare it with, again, naive, um, let's say hand waving um, prediction of uh, axion on, on of the ground state plus the axion plus the momentum in a relativistic um, mode. Let's say I observe that there is some kind of um, of approximate agreement. Now, having I hope that I convinced you that there is there is an axion on our theory. Closing my presentation, I just want to say that very, very, uh, very briefly that we also extracted the spectrum of the K equals two string. So, which means that uh, it's not the fundamental representation anymore, but it's the K equals two anti-symmetric representation for SU5. And um, this is the fundamental representation, uh, zero minus minus ground state, which is in agreement with the axion. And if I thought, I mean, I keep the axion must uh, the same, and if I plot ground state of zero minus minus the K equals two anti-symmetric representation, I see that it is in a in a in a good agreement. I mean, it's a mass which is in a good agreement with uh, the axion. So it looks like the axion has some kind of universality. The axion mass has some kind of universality properties. So uh, so it is. It looks like the flux loop looks pretty much like a bosonic Nabucodo string, either for, even for short flux tubes. This is striking for two plus one dimensions. It also holds for three plus one, albeit with some striking differences. There is indeed a massive axion particle with quantum numbers of zero minus minus on the worksheet of the flux tube in three plus one dimensions with mass approximately um, uh, 1.85 in unit of, of, uh, of, of root uh, sigma, the string tension. It looks like there is massive state with mass twice the axion, the mass of the axion. And the axions appear also in the spectrum of the K equals two string with the same mass. So there is some kind of universality, and there are also signals for more more multiple uh, So thanks a lot for your attentions. Please uh, ask uh, questions. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Let's uh, thank Andreas for a nice overview and uh, Marek. Yes, uh, you showed some plots with yes. results from various values of NC and mm -hmm. they seem to pretty much lie on top of each other. Can you quantify the question of one over NC convergence? 
Um, okay. Um, just a second. Um, you mean that uh, whether it obeys in uh, one over n squared uh, um, expansion? That's the question, right? Not only that, but it's very interesting to ask what is the coefficient of the leading correction, because after all, we see that one over NC explains a lot of facts about the real world. So it's an interesting theoretical laboratory that you have that measures the size of corrections to the large NC limit. Well, absolutely. I mean, this can be done for a lot of uh, for a lot of, of quantities. For instance, global masses and the string tension. It's of the order. I, I think for some quantities, for instance, of the order of, of 10 ten percent. I mean, uh, uh, this correction. But I mean, I can provide some numbers. I mean, I don't want uh, to say I mean numbers from uh, by heart. But uh, I mean to extract to extract. Um, um, Approximation of this uh, leading correction for this uh, for this uh, for this um, quantity. I mean, I need to do something something more dedicated on that because uh, I, one has to keep fixed del root sigma. Actually, in the past we performed such a, such a calculation, but I can provide the number. I mean, uh, uh, but it definitely looks like. Uh, SU3 is, is extremely close to, to large N. So, but um, yeah, I can provide the number. I mean, um, if Thank that's you. Okay. Thank you. That would be very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's clearly that what we see here is, is large N, is large N uh, physics. Okay. So even for SU3, we observe large N physics. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's clear. Okay. And actually the mass of the, of the of the um, this is actually the the old work in, from five years ago that we performed. What we did is that we kept the lattice the, the L fixed and we moved from SU two to SU uh, twelve. Okay, and there we we extracted how the mass depends on uh, on n. So it obeys an n squared, but it seems that the mass uh, is more or less, um, it doesn't change much. I mean, as you move from n equals 3 to n equals uh, 12. Of, of course, n equals 12, as I explained you, has some difficulties. I mean, for instance, the topological freezing, and it's hard, it is harder to investigate. So, but um, yeah, I will provide these numbers, okay? Andreas, Maria, yes, I, 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 I want to ask you whether what you see in the spectra is uh, indeed uh, in the structure of uh, rigid trajectories. If you take for a fixed n and you vary j or for a fixed j you vary n, I remember from your paper it doesn't seem to to be that you get a straight uh, line that connects all the points, but rather a piecewise uh, line. So what is the situation? Why don't you show us uh, m squared as a function of j or n? Uh, I mean, Kobe. I think this is uh, this is relevant for globals, right? Not for um, I mean uh, for these flat tubes. I mean, okay. I mean, um, um, yeah. It's hard to answer this question whether there is some uh, meaningful comparison with rigid trajectories. I mean, we also had a discussion. I mean, uh, but uh, uh, let me think a bit more about this, and we can we can continue our discussion. Um, Okay, but I don't think this is, um, it's, it's really mean, meaningful for this, um, for the flux, for the, for the closed flux tube. Um, well, 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 how do you distinguish between the closed flux tube and the spectra of global? Is it not uh, the same? No, no, it's not the same. It's not the same. The, um, this is uh, the flux to be basically it it's uh, it wins around the, the spatial torus is completely different. While I mean the the flux tubes for um, I mean the, the, the for the for the for the globals are uh, um, contractible. I mean small uh, small loops. I mean that. Uh, that um, I mean are uh, on uh, basically on, are on a uh, I mean on a spatial spatial plane. I mean, so it's it's not the same thing. It's um, it's and, and for and for that and for the, for the global, you didn't uh, you didn't uh, compute the spectra or I'm confused. No, no, for globals, yeah, for globals, we we calculate the spectra. We calculate the spectra and the spectra. I think I mean to I mean. I, 
I, I won't say a, a very good approximation, but it looks like they obey they obey uh, a regular trajectory. The, the thing with, with the, the, the global spectra, I mean, in order to be able to see this regular, regular trajectory, you need to extract, I mean, uh, uh, excitations with high um, high spins, I mean, large spins. Right. Right. And in, in order to do that, I mean, so our last um, uh, calculation for globals, we actually um, just projected onto the irreducible representations of the hexagonal group of, uh, of uh, octagonal group of, of of rotations, which actually cannot identify, for instance, between different spins. I mean, you need to do some kind of of, of, of guesswork in order to understand. I mean, whether a state is, for instance, of spin three or spin four, and so on. I mean, in order to do this kind of work, I mean, you need to do. You need to build. I mean, you need a dedicated calculation, which uh, where you have to build operators with, uh, I mean, uh, diagonal elements. Let's say that are able to project onto high spin states. This is something that can obviously um, uh, be done, but it, it 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 will take a lot of of human resources and a lot of time. I mean, to do it's actually a very good project that one uh, could uh, could do, and uh, I hope that we will be able to do it in the in, in the future. But uh, you really need to go uh, high on, on spin in order to be able to see good uh, trajectories. Uh, in one, one, uh, let me one, just say one. something. Please don't forget to use the raise hand feature so that uh, I can keep track of one plus question. But let me, uh, let me pass to Marina so that uh, uh, she raised her hand a long time ago. Uh, thanks very much, Pedro. Thanks, Andreas, for the great talk. Um, so uh, in one of the first plots where you show this comparison between the global mass and two times the axial mass, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, do you vary only the length of the string or do you also uh, vary the, the lattice spacing? So in other words, uh, I mean, the sigma. Uh, so uh, so yeah, do yeah. your results for different lattice spacing follow the same line? Yeah, I mean, more or less. I mean, the, this plot I showed here, okay, I mean, this plot basically says you see for beta of 6.0625. I the mean, uh, fixed here so we, we fix the string tension here, I mean, uh, and yeah. we vary L. But, uh, as I show you in this, um, in this plot here, um, let me just show you, I mean, this is actually the phase space of the calculation. So this is what I showed you. In addition, we extracted SU3 with beta of 6.338, which corresponds to actually thirds of this lattice spacing. And we also, uh, same for that, we keep we have, um, the lattice spacing fixed. And we also, also I mean, calculate the spectra for SU5 in the value of beta. And actually, this is what I showed uh, uh, the second, what I showed here. Um, yeah, here you can see these are all the. Um, I mean, all the gauge groups, so SU3 with beta of 6.0625 and beta of 6. So you have two, two values of the lattice space. Yeah, I have two values. Lie yeah. on top of the, each other. Yeah, all right. I mean, having a third value, it would be extremely, I mean, difficult in terms of time. I mean, it's, uh, it would be good, of course, to have, I mean, uh, to go closer to the continuum, but uh, one has to take into account the, I mean, the, the critical slowing down. Uh, and um, yeah, it is a bit uh, difficult, at least at this stage, I mean, with the given computational resources. And uh, I hope that there would be, there is some hope, I mean, with some uh, improved uh, improved algorithms, for instance, tempor temporal, I mean, parallel tempering by um, the group of Massimo, Dilia. Um, we'll see in the future what we can do. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Maybe one last very quick question from Lance, and then we move yeah. forward. Yeah, just a question about uh, when you say there is no longitudinal excitation in D equals 3, and there is exactly 1 in D equals 4, does that come with a caveat of below a certain mass? I would imagine if you have a very massive excitation, you, it's much harder for you to see. Um, if so, like what what mass relative to the axion mass is the bound is the statement that there isn't another one? Uh, uh, you mean for the three plus one dimension? Yeah, in the case uh, that you I... say there's one state, how do we know there isn't another state? Maybe it's just uh, too heavy for you to see. No, absolutely. I mean, um, I would say, I mean, okay. It's a, it's a very good question, actually. It has to do, first of all, with um, with the current, uh, I mean, uh, statistics. 
and also with my choice of um, of uh, of lattice spacing, uh, because as you move to lattice space to smaller lattice spacing, basically the energy in lattice unit becomes less and less. I mean, and uh, I mean uh, states can appear um, uh, clearly. I mean, okay, so it, actually. I would say for this kind of calculation, um, um, I, I had difficulties to extract states with, uh, uh, okay, so uh, there is the problem of, uh, of the actual, uh, the, the extracting energy due to lattice systematics, and there is also the problem of having, uh, from some point and above, you have a plethora of states, because, for instance, here you can see that Nambugoro n left equals two and right equals two, uh, consists of like, I don't know, 17 states. So when J equals zero, I mean, will be like five states. So it will be really hard to identify the, um, the, the, um, the action mode if it's hidden within this uh, string state. I mean, I would say, I mean, uh, uh, we can say clearly that we cannot see other excitation at other, uh, um, Action from E root sigma, energy root sigma of around six, uh, seven and above. I mean, at this, uh, I would say. But it's a very good question. Maybe I, I'll have a look, and um, I always have, I always have that in mind. I mean, that the fact that due to systematics and due to, I mean, plethora of states that we get, we cannot. Maybe we get actions and we cannot identify them. Thanks. Very good. We can continue during the discussion. Let's thank Andreas once more.